What's going on, everyone? This is Decred in Depth. I'm your host, Angelo. And on today's show, we have Zubair Zia. Zubair is a Decred community member who has taken time to study the importance of security. So, Zubair, how you doing? I'm doing great, Angelo. How are you doing? Oh, I'm doing excellent. So let's get into it. Uh, let's talk about your background and your intro into the cryptocurrency space. Okay. So as a day job, I'm a technical consultant and I take on contractual work as projects come along, mostly in the IT service management space. I'm also pretty entrepreneurial, uh, so I am involved in startups as well. Uh, I have one right now where we're trying to enhance human athletic movement uh, by fusing technology and clothing. Uh, besides that, so in cryptocurrencies, my introduction um, into the cryptocurrency space was as a miner in 2012, 2013. I was very intrigued with the fact that you could run a software on your computer to earn money. Now. I, I had a hobby of playing these games like Diablo and World of Warcraft, and I would farm gold and find rare items in these sort of games. So I love to automate the playing portion of these games by creating these scripts that would mimic your keystrokes based on in-game info and stuff. So when you do these runs over and over again, you would find rewards, which you could sell online for money to other players. So I think mining really intrigued me because of the parallels. Um, anyways, I was uh, initially mining Litecoin and Vertcoin. Those were the only coins I could meaningfully mine as Bitcoin had ASICs, uh, application-specific integrated circuits uh, developed for for which the producers were not very trustworthy. Uh, so I didn't want to take the risk of ordering ASICs from them. But it was initially profitable with GPUs. So I doubled down and scaled it up to a point where I had a decent sized GPU farm in my garage, about 15 to 20 GPUs making money for me. This didn't last long though, and I liquidated all of it after the market crash in 2014, if I can recall correctly. So that was my initial introduction to the space and I felt the volatility as a miner. However, the, the space was promising, so I kept my eye on it. Then in around 2016, I started investing again. I got very intrigued by Ethereum at first. I saw it as a potential, as a I saw its potential as a platform for smart contracts, and it pulled me back in as an investor. But uh, I thought it was a bit overvalued after a certain point as I learned more about the tech. Um, then in my search to diversify, I found Decred. Uh, at this time. I also had a whole bunch of tokens and coins that did not have much use and provided nothing novel or differentiated. So as I learned more about the technologies and philosophies of the space, I began investing more into Decred because it started making more and more sense to do so. Also, the staking component kept me active as you could do more things and just be a passive holder. And at the same time, um, you want to know more of the state of the network because your stake is locked up. So it kept me involved in the community because, of course, I had skin in the game. Um, Decred uh, was also appealing because the initial devs created Bitcoin from the ground up in Golang and that they advocated for multiple alternate full node implementations of Bitcoin. And in their journey, they had identified issues with its decision making, where naturally one group had enormous influence. This really struck a chord and got me thinking about governance, which I uh, really did not understand deeply or cared for before I found Decred. So now for those that don't know, um, how are blockchains secured like Bitcoin and, and why is it important? Why does that matter? Okay, uh, so Bitcoin uses proof of work to secure and keep a coherent global view of its, of its state. Um, so proof of work actually has a pretty cool history behind it. And it was pretty interesting to find out the applications it was used for before Bitcoin. It was originally intended as a way to prevent abusive usage of an open accessible resource by attaching a very small computational cost. And so one of the ways it was utilized was for preventing email spam. The way it would limit spam was to make it costly for a spammer to send out emails in large bunches. So whenever an email was sent, uh, the sender has to compute a solution to a crypto puzzle, as we know in proof of work, and attach it to an email, uh, which will then get verified at the receiver's end. 
While for a normal user, it won't be a really big issue because they wouldn't be bothered by a delay of a second or less. Uh, the cost for a spammer, however, would be a deal breaker as the amount of emails they send uh, is ranging in thousands and it would just not be economical. Um, so we can think of the deterrent properties of proof of work to be similar to like a CAPTCHA humans you know, have to solve in order to log into an account or like rolling a dice and trying to get one of the sides, uh, but created for computers. And the way it's used in Bitcoin is similar yet more elegant. It's similar in the way that it requires the computer to try to find a solution over and over again, like rolling a dice to find a side, which makes it a costly exercise because the probability of finding the right answer implies a lot of computing cycles. And the users uh, are participating to earn a digital token that is unique and limited in supply. So the proof of work is designed to be more dynamic, uh, which means making the problems harder to solve as profit motivated actors try to mine more and more and making it easier to solve when computers go offline for any number of reasons, uh, w which makes it a desirable protocol for a system that runs on a decentralized network uh, and is permissionless in nature. The ability to change the difficulty of the challenge uh, keeps the average block production and money supply at a predictable rate, which we know as 10 minutes in Bitcoin and five minutes in Decred. Uh, and as a desired side effect makes it costly uh, for any one selfish actor to dominate the network and do dishonest work or dishonest things like spend their money twice. Um, yeah. So what does an attack look like and uh, what, are the what are the requirements for a POW attack? So to, to get the requirements for an attack on proof of work or pure proof of work in this case, you would need to calculate the total computational power of the network, which can be known by the hash rate of the network. The understanding is that if 50% of the computational power is honest and working to find a solution for a war, then the network is within the safe parameters. So when talking about blockchain security for pure proof of work, and this is, by the way, strictly speaking about protocol security properties by design and not regarding the specifics of the temp technical implementation or bugs found within it, the requirements for an attack would be the cost required to attain 50% of the total hash power of the network, so half of it. And whatever cost you calculate would be theoretical because the costs could go up or down depending on how the network is reacting to the addition of the hash power. Uh, so it's a level of confidence versus hard security guarantees as no one can guarantee that a majority attack won't happen because it's very much allowed by design. Uh, but there can be a level of confidence attained by understanding the current economic value of the network and the incentives that result from it for honest work versus dishonest work. So if, if it's easy to make money off dishonest work, like for example, if I can rent hash power and double spend my money or short and or short the token on an exchange and make a lot of money, then just, then just getting the block reward and transaction fees, it's likely not a secure blockchain and shouldn't be used for storing large amounts of value. No, that makes sense. Uh, what are your thoughts on the weaknesses of a pure proof of work system when it comes to crypto assets? So I think uh, pure proof of work has weaknesses that can come up based on multiple factors. So the algorithm use needs to be novel, like, and it has to be fast and secure for hardware implementations. Otherwise, a lot of weaknesses can emerge. You want to be, you also want to be the dominant chain with the majority hash power, or you can be a victim of a majority attack like a 51% attack or a strip mining attack. Um, these kinds of attacks can occur easily if you have less hash power compared to a bigger network with the same hashing algorithm. If a chain wants to avoid these things, it would be a good practice to have a, a, a unique hashing algorithm that can be uh, that is very efficiently hashed on specialized mach machines so that you have dedicated infrastructure and diversity in hardware manufacturers from the get-go. A big red flag for anyone looking uh, to determine if a proof of work chain is safe would be to see if you could rent more than 50% of the hash power of the network uh, via a, a hash power rental service. Because this essentially means someone can attack the network without investing capital 
uh, to purchase the physical machines, making the cost of attack um, a fraction of what it would be if someone had to purchase the equipment and had to pay for the space, the electricity to run it, um, and the all the costs involved maintaining it. They wouldn't need any, if at all, skin in the game. Um, another issue f for proof of work is that it could be susceptible to hardware backdoor attacks by uh, something like a state level actor. Since there's only a few hardware manufacturers in the world, a state could a state could possibly you know force these manufacturers to put backdoors in these these specialized ASICs, these specialized hardwares, uh, and then you know these can be turned on and off or controlled, as an example. And uh, and I, I think another issue is uh, um, of pure proof of work is the lack of a mechanism to pull the network and gauge social consensus for critical hard forks which may be you know critical for the survival of the whole network because you know humans are fallible it's not too hard to think that technology used in these systems may require updates due to a bug or unforeseeable event emerging that could either kill the network or damage it and set it back years or even decades so currently if a proof of work based blockchain try to conduct a hard fork it will likely result in a contentious fork uh, and splinter its community and value and create chaos. So pure proof of work has the inability to safely hard fork. You, you really just have hash power to gauge consensus, which has to coordinate with economic nodes like exchanges. Individual nodes that don't mine or have little to no economic weight really don't have much power, which makes sense as you know anyone can spin up as many nodes you know for a negligible cost. And what are your thoughts on a pure proof of stake system? It has some inherent issues, but it also has, you know, provides some hope. Uh, and there's a lot of research and work being done in this area. Uh, it may be possible that these issues, uh, you know, that I'll I'll try to describe have been will be addressed in the future. However, for now, I'll share three that seem to be valid arguments against pure proof of stake. Um, so, in in proof proof of stake, instead of a calculation that your machines waste energy on coin holders would be the ones creating and approving blocks. How this happens can depend on the specifics of each implementation, but the issues that result are uh, there's no there's no robust or great mechanism in place, or at least to my understanding, to distribute the coins fairly. Therefore, the coin is born centralized and continues to stay so. As the initial holders keep growing their stake along with their influence. You can also get uh, the nothing at stake problem where a chain is unable to settle on a fork as no computationally expensive work, uh, like in proof of work, uh, is being done to converge on a particular chain. So in theory, validators could, in their own self-interest, support any number of forks as it wouldn't cost them anything and because they would stand to gain from any fork that ends up winning. And lastly, there's there's like zero world cost, real world costs to changing the previous blocks because there's no energy requirement to redo the work that was done to mine the previous blocks. This makes proof, proof of stake less costly to change and then less immutable in theory uh, as it's easier to change the history versus you know pure proof of work. So now Decred has a hybrid consensus algorithm. Do you want to cover it and explain what a hybrid proof of work and proof of stake system is? Yeah, sure. So the the hybrid system uh, is Decred's protocol, and it's unique as it weaves the proof of stake on top of uh, proof of work in a very elegant way. It's really something that differentiate, differentiates Decred from pure proof of work and pure proof of stake cryptocurrencies. So, in my um, so in my rough example where I gave before uh, about proof of work being like a, a CAPTCHA humans have to solve, but made for computers. You could think of the hybrid protocol as a CAPTCHA plus a two-factor authentication. The, the staking component uh, also grants users, you know, the added ability to participate in the governance on the chain, on-chain by approving or rejecting blocks produced by proof of work and off-chain by directing funding for development. Uh, which is a novel way to fund and direct development and then be able to approve network upgrades. Um, and the way Decred's staking uh, 
occurs is the, or the way the decrypt staking layer is weaved into the proof of work also augments the security properties of the network. So for example, if you had an attacker who wanted to reject blocks, the nature of how on-chain works makes it very costly for them because each block they, f they find will pull a random set of uh, what you call tickets. Um, and if they fail in getting enough tickets, the block will be invalid and other blocks won't be able to build on top of it. So uh, if an attacker attempted to do so again, make another attempt at Finding a, finding a block. Uh, because the solution found by proof of work for each block will be different every time, they will pull a random, they will pull a different set of randomly selected tickets from the live ticket pool every time and not be able to leverage the ones they had pulled before to approve the blocks. Uh, this randomness really makes uh, the hybrid protocol very unique and uh, hard to game. So now what benefits does this provide over, say, a pure proof of work system? Um, the, the, the combination of uh, proof of work and proof of stake in this unique way makes the network very secured from majority attacks, as I found in my research. Along with being extremely secure, another benefit of the hybrid protocol is its ability to adapt more efficiently than pure proof of work. Pure proof of work works beautifully when there are no conflicts and there is adequate incentive to participate. But as soon as there is decision making on the social or human layer, uh, proof of work struggles, and in my opinion, becomes less than optimal. So now, how secure is it in comparison to a pure, pure proof of work system, and uh, how much of the coin staked or network hash power would need to be obtained in order to form, say, a majority attack on Decred's uh, hybrid protocol? Okay, so so to, to explain Decred security in comparison to pure proof of work, you really need to know how much percentage of uh, the coins or the stake is participating on the network. Um, this amount really matters as an attacker will need to have a large portion of the participating stake in order to conduct an attack. Uh, in my findings, Decred was around 20 times more expensive to attack. And this was done last summer uh, in an apples to apples comparison with Bitcoin. Uh, this was based on the assumptions that the attacker has in possession 50% of the, the active ticket pool and 50% of the net, total network hash power. I believe some others have predicted up to 40x more expensive. Uh, it's hard to really know though because, because the exact number, um, it, it's based on several variables uh, involved for which we need to make assumptions because you need a combination of stake and hash power. Just like how Pure proof of work gets more expensive to attack. The more decentralized, decentralized, active, and bigger the network gets, the hybrid proof of work, proof of stake, becomes even more costlier to attack as the network gets more active and decentralized. So now, for those that may not know, um, explain Decred's voting system a bit to understand this process and the approval by stakeholders on how that affects security. Okay, so I'll, I'll touch on uh, how the voting works uh, in, in a high-level perspective. So voting happens uh, via something called tickets, and these tickets are attained by time-locking uh, your Decred coins. So if you want to participate in voting on-chain and off-chain, you need to lock up your coins for a period of potentially four months, but on average, it works out to 28 days. The way voting uh, uh, participates in consensus is that each block found by a miner uh, via proof of work is required to pull in a minimum of three and up to a maximum of five randomly selected tickets uh, for the node to accept uh, the block as valid. The tickets are selected from a live ticket pool that could contain, I think it's around 40,960 tickets, uh, but it could be more or less. Uh, there's an algorithm that constantly aims to keep the pool at around 4,960 tickets by adjusting the ticket price every 144 blocks, which if the network is working uh, uh, smoothly and uh, every five minutes blocks are coming in, it'll take around 12 hours. So this price is the amount of decred uh, required to lock up uh, for voting rights. There's also a way to uh, own parts of a ticket, but I won't go into that. Um, so miners cannot build on top of a block if it does not get signed by at least three tickets that are randomly selected from this live ticket pool. Uh, 
This randomness makes gaming the system very costly because each block pulls a new set of randomly selected tickets. So if you're trying to get your block approved, you need, uh, and you're an attacker, you need to own the majority of the live ticket pool in order to keep up uh, and have the probability of uh, keeping up with the honest network. Otherwise, you will be very slow and will be mining at a massive loss. So now let me flip it. Um, if I want to attack the network with only hash power and I can only get a small portion of the tickets, is that a, a possibility? Yeah, so it's it's a possibility. Uh, because the attacker requirements has this this insane curve it has like a factorial curve uh, for hash power you can in theory form an attack if you have less than the majority of the live tickets under your control but then you will need an increasingly impractical amount of hash power uh, i'm talking about 10 to you know thousand times depending on your stake uh it probably goes even higher than that so in my calculation for example if the attacker had five percent of the active tickets they would need like almost 900 times the hash power of the entire network to have the probability to find and approve blocks faster than the rest of the network on average. So you really need to dominate the ticket pool in order to attack or make sense for an attack. So now do you care uh, to explain why the price of the ticket pool rises? Um, can I just purchase the amount of required tickets in one go, in one shot? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. Uh, and the Decred is well designed to handle such an attempt because each block is only allowed to contain 20 new tickets, which then stay in an immature state for almost a full day before entering this live ticket, uh, live pool uh, or a matured state. Uh, this ticket price, uh, like I said, constantly adjusts to aim for a, f a ticket pool that has 4,960 tickets. Uh, and this adjustment happens every 144 blocks. Uh, uh, so if I want to buy out half of the tick pool to have a chance for an attack, I would need to keep buying tickets in each block and have to lock in more and more decred or DCR token to take over the ticket pool. Now, in uh, in this at this time, the rest of the network will likely react uh, and it will make the cost even higher. Uh, because everyone wants to purchase more tickets as well. They want to participate in consensus. So the network would uh, notice a steep increase in the ticket price every 144 blocks, making the attack extremely costly un and un uneconomical. So now we always hear investors say that uh, security is the most important when it comes to investing in a blockchain. What are some of the, of the other benefits you see that Decred has from a security standpoint over Bitcoin or maybe some of its uh, minor hard forks? Mm-hmm. So if we think about it, uh, with the block reward um, being reduced uh, because we have hard caps on cryptocurrencies um, like Bitcoin, Decred, uh, the shift towards a fee-dominated uh, protocol, as in the fees will incentivize miners to mine or not, uh, when the block reward becomes insignificant in a few decades, say, uh, it, it's a big unknown and it's very possible that it may not be enough of an incentive to keep miners honest. Um, potentially have we could potentially have a lot of attacks in the future. Um, it's a bit unknown. So in a few in such a future, uh, a hybrid protocol like Decred would be more s secure for the same cost, uh, making it you know more secure in the long term if the network partic participation remains healthy. Uh, from this standpoint, what do you feel or what do you think Decred can do, can do to improve on its security to strengthen the chain over time? Uh, so uh, so a big part is um, on-chain participation. So the incentives to participate in uh, staking is a big thing, in my opinion. Um, it's central to Decred security. I do think participating to direct um, uh, funding is a, you know, it's a great incentive you know, people want to participate to to vote on off chain as well, which is which is great. It's, it's in addition to the block reward. Uh, however, however, I think it wouldn't hurt if we started, you know, laying the foundation for uh, more incentives for participation. Um, I don't know what this could mean at this time. For example, um, rewarding stakeholders with a fair percentage of the transaction feeds may need to be introduced in a future where we see declining participation rates. Um, another one um, would be uh, 
recognizing damaging minor behavior. So uh, if we develop tools and heuristics that identify such things, the network may stand to benefit. These are just some areas, you know, worth exploring. And I'm pretty sure there's plenty more. Um, the best thing about Decred is that there's a process, you know, to propose changes, fund research and development so that we can stay ahead of the curve on the known issues and yet to be known issues. So, um, Zubair, well, uh, tell me, what has you optimistic in the current moment with uh, with the project? The participation rates on, you know, um, the staking component are, you know, makes me super bullish. I believe people are, you know, putting skin in the game, even in a bear market. And I think this really uh, uh, makes my confidence go up uh, because, uh, um, you know, people really believe in this uh, in this project. I think that's the number one thing that kind of uh, uh, makes me believe that Decred is, uh, you know, has value. And, you know, when people stake and that gives the security properties the, that, you know, I was researching. So, so not only does it signal to everyone that, you know, the network is actively participating uh, and everyone involved has skin in the game, um, it, it also makes it really expensive for any other one party to attack the network. So yeah, those are the, that's something that keeps me optimistic. So now let's get into the Decred Bulletproof section. Um, I'm about to change these questions too, because we're going on episode 10 soon. <laughs> but um, this is a part of the show where uh, I scour the internet and collect views from people criticizing or attacking the project. So I'll play devil's advocate here for, for a second. Uh, if Decred was to fail, what would be the cause of its death? So like I said before, uh, the incentives, uh, if the incentives defined by the protocol stop working to keep the protocol safe or keep the network safe, uh, it would be a reason for Decred's failure. And you know, similarly likely for Bitcoin or any permissionless, uh, open permissionless cryptocurrency. Uh, but at the same time, with the ability to adapt uh, efficiently, uh, Decred has a good chance of being able to solve critical critical issues before total doom. Hmm. Um, here's another statement. Uh, some say it's good for it to be difficult to change consensus. Decred does nothing special other than draw focus to a specific activation method baked into the protocol layer, which can be ported into any other project. Mm -hmm. So I, I think I disagree with that. Um, I think the difficulty in changing consensus rules uh, is a function of how large and decentralized your network is. In pure proof of work, you could easily coordinate to change the network unless it gets really massive like we see in Bitcoin, at which point you risk you know, contesting forks. You'll have a lot of chain splits. Uh, similarly, in Decred, the bigger and more decentralized the network gets, the harder it will be to change the rules. Um, however, it's more efficient than proof of work because there is a robust way to signal and activate changes without, you know, risking hard forks, uh, sorry, contentious forks. Correct. So now um, Bitcoin launch without a pre-mine, all other projects outside of Bitcoin are built around the financial interests of their creators. What are your thoughts? I think Bitcoin launching without a pre-mine was just because it's you know it's, it was the first of its kind. It's such an early stage that the creator, didn't, the creators, or the creator or the creators, I'm not sure if Tachi Satoshi was a bunch of people, uh, did not even know uh, if it would be that successful. Uh, it, so, and also the early creators had a massive head start because uh, most of the world had no idea about the space. So, not that I agree with pre-mines. I think the network should have a launch that is fair and only you know enough it uh, should be pre-mined that should be necessary in Decred's case however we did have a pre-mine but it was very transparent and it was one that was very fair and it was required in my opinion so people will invest in things that make the world better whether it be time or money they will invest you don't need a dev fund embedded into your protocol to incentivize development what are your thoughts on that statement I, th I think a dev fund in invested by the the network is a really clever way of bootstrapping the the whole network. the The problem with relying on outside capital, I think, uh, investing in a, in a project, especially in an early stage, 
is that it can derail or capture the technology because the investors, the outside investors can have misaligned incentives versus the net rest of the network, the rest of the open network. This, this is because a, say, a venture capital firm um, backing development of a coin would, would likely want to return on investment on, on a fixed horizon, and it will employ all sorts of strategies to do so, which may go undetectable by a network because they're very sneaky. Also, uh, a network fund in Decred's case is going to be directed by the participating stakeholders since Decred is here for decades and possibly centuries. Uh, you know, a network fund funded by the block reward keeps incentives in line is a, and it's is a very transparent way, in my opinion, to fund development uh, and other initiatives. Um, it's also really cool to think how much money the network will have uh, when the value of the token and liquidity rises. Decred could potentially have thousands and thousands of contractors and companies working for it around the world. So this this is also something that really intrigues me. Yeah, optimistic. Um, so Zubair, to close out, do you have anything you want to say to potential stakeholders and uh, stay active, <laughs> uh, keep participating, and you know this is the best time I think to uh, to load up on Decred. You know, we might not get a better chance than right now. Um, so yeah. That's what I would say. Well, brother, I appreciate you coming on the show. Thank you for taking time out. Thank you, Angelo. I really appreciate this uh, opportunity and I hope I gave some value. Yeah, absolutely. Always. Oh,